Hello friends. In my previous videos in this series, I talked to you about the failed voiding or persistent obstructive voiding following TURP. In this video, I'll be talking to you of a third clinical scenario wherein after TURP, the patient is discharged, he goes home satisfactorily, he is passing stream nicely, no problems, but he comes back to you after four to six weeks with severe degree of obstructive and storage low urinary symptoms. In this third clinical scenario, let me talk in this presentation about what has gone wrong and why has that all happened. So clarifying to you the clinical scenario again, initially the patient was voiding rather well, but it is only after four to six weeks new symptoms appear afresh and dominant part of these symptoms are obstructive low urinary tract symptoms. And this must be the question in the mind of the patient and also in your mind, what has gone wrong? Actually, these patients develop some kind of urethral narrowing. And this urethral narrowing can happen at all locations from external urinary meters to the bladder neck. It can happen in all sizes, short, medium, long, and it can happen in all kinds of severities. If you see the normal anatomy of a male after transurethral section, and that is how the, the spongial tissue and urethra bladder neck looks like, this is normal arrangement. You can have urethral narrowing at the level of external urinary meatus, known as meatal stricture. You can have a narrowing at the level of urethra just proximal to fossa navicularis. You can have a narrowing at pinobulbar junction in form of a medium sized structure. You can have narrowing in the proximal bulbar area or you can have narrowing in membranous urethra or you can have a narrowing at the level of bladder neck. The narrowing at the level of bladder neck is known as bladder neck stenosis while all the narrowings in urethra are known as urethral structures. You can have a very serious type of structure in some patients and that is a complete urethra is involved what is known as pan-urethral structure. So the question must be coming to your mind why does this urethral structure or bladder neck stenosis occur after transurethral section? If you understand this problem in this way that there will be certain intraoperative factors which will result in this kind of issue. And there are certain factors which exist in the patient prior to that TURP is done and the certain factors which exist after TURP has been done. So they are known as accordingly pre-TURP factors and post-TURP factors. If I were to sum up to you first the intraoperative factors and try and explain to you what are those factors which play a role while you are doing transurethral section, which ultimately end up in structure formation after four to six weeks or a bladder neck stenosis after four to six weeks. Say suppose this is stricture urethra. The main flaw here is healing by fibrosis. This can result either from the mechanical trauma when you are introducing the receptoscope sheath in the urethra at that time. There can be frictional injury, abrasive injury from the tip of the sheath. There may be introduction of fresh infection or exacerbation of previous infection in the urethra. There can be ischemia in the wall of the urethra 
or at the level of bladder neck or at the level of fossa navicularis by a rigid sheath placed inside the uterine lumen or there can be a back leak of current from the sheath which comes from tip of the sheath and wherever the sheath is in contact with the urethra there will be leakage of current or there can be access of a thermal injury where you are resecting by transurethral resection if you do over cautery deep cuts then thermal injury can result so these are four independent type of factors which occur in varying severity to give rise to structural later on but then you must also remember that all these factors can get interrelated and one leads to the other kind of pathology and they are you know operational in their own way now if you consider all these four factors in a patient of structural stenosis and you are answering why if you consider all those four factors not everything plays role in everybody out of these four a one may be a dominant feature like in somebody a pressure ischemia is a dominant feature or in other person a infection is the dominant feature or in other person there can be three factors dominating as a etiological factor for causation of structure so if i were to tell you which factor is the most important factor at which site so for example if you have stenosis in meatus meatal stenosis or meatal structure at the level of external meatus as seen in this picture in this case the major reason for development of meatal stenosis is pressure ischemia which you create during transurethral resection and how do you create that for instance in the picture here this is a patient who is undergoing transurethral resection and during the resection patient develop marked erection your resectoscope sheath may fall short and you have to press it in to reach up to the level of bladder neck particularly if the prostate gland is also large and it has significant intravesical protrusion so the the back of the sheath is squeezing compressing on the meatus for as long as you're doing resection and subsequently it may result in this kind of problem meatal infection meatal necrosis the part of the glandular area is also getting necrosed and it will result in this kind of meatal structure later on in some patients where you apply a gauge piece traction at the level of meatus in this manner and if you leave this gauge piece there for more than 15 20 minutes then this is a severe pressure at the level of meatus and this can also result into a subsequent meatal stenosis in another situation of structure at the level of urethra just proximal to fossa navicularis and if you were to understand what is, are the etiological factors here the main factor is mechanical trauma now at the time of introduction of the sheath when you introduce your sheath the sharp edge of the sheath can rub as it enters from wide fossa navicularis to narrow urethra there is a change in the caliber so at this point there is a frictional injury abrasive injury which results into uh, structure later on at this point of course there can be a pressure ischemia in some patient by a wider catheter but mechanical trauma is a main factor in a third location where you get pino bulbar structure and if you were to ask me what reasons here the main reason is pressure ischemia and also the leakage of current because it is here the urethra is angulated during transurethral resection and it is here a wider part of sheath remains in contact with the urethral wall the leakage of electrical current can give rise to structure formation the pressure ischemia at this point is dominantly because of the traction that you apply on the catheter most common way of applying traction on the catheter is that you anchor and secure the catheter shaft to the thigh of the patient 
and you exert a pull in order to exert a pressure on the operated fossa and to arrest bleeding as shown in this picture. Because of this persistent pull, the ureter remains bent ventrally at the level of penobulbar junction and subsequently patient may get stricture here. In order to prevent this, there is another way of putting traction where you fix the catheter to the abdominal wall in the manner shown here. So thigh traction is a culprit. In either location at proximal verbal area where you see often see a very short structure at this point. And again, you ask me which is the main factor responsible. Here I would say mechanical trauma because when you introduce the sheath, it goes straight up to the proximal bulb and then you have to bend the penis down to enter the bladder. And as you change the direction of the tip of the sheath, here often trauma occurs and subsequently gives rise to stricture. Infection can also be either a part later on. At the level of bladder neck, the reasons for stricture formation out of these four, most important reason is electrical thermal injury. When you perform a deep resection at the level of bladder neck, this is a main factor. And again, when you put a catheter traction and you expect the full balloon to exert tamponade at the level of bladder neck to occlude the bleeders, then if you allow this balloon traction to stay on for some more time, it can subsequently result in pressure ischemia and the stricture afterwards. In some patients, you develop this disease, a pan stricture. And then again, if you ask me the reasons for it, out of these four, infection inside the entire urethra or in some patients, the allergic response to the catheter material or some kind of chemical used during the surgery, which gives rise to an extensive inflammatory reaction in the entire urethra and a pan stricture results. Some people feel it can even be due to electrical leakage of the current through the sheath or the pressure of the sheath in the urethra. So all four factors will be there, but I'm telling you which is the most dominant factor. So I hope you have understood that at different sites in the urethra, stricture results, and at each site, the major etiological factor, major intraoperative etiological factor is different. Then talking to you about what are the major preoperative and postoperative factors. This is the kind of situation where you have the catheter in the urethra and in preoperative stage, many patients are on in instead of urinary retention and they live on catheter for some time before they go for surgery. In developing country, they live on catheter for some time, even months because they have to arrange for resources and people will look after them. So there are certain factors which are there because of the catheter. They are called catheter factors. For example, if there's a trauma during insertion of catheter or during the change of the catheter, or if there's an infection in urethra during insertion of catheter, or if there is pressure ischemia because of malpositioning of the catheter, then all these catheter induced factors can accentuate the intraprocedural factors. You can have some degree of infection present in the low urinary tract already. And for some reason, patient underwent the operation with infection present either in urethra or in the bladder lumen or even in the prostate gland. There are certain host factors also. And the host factors are like diabetes if it is uncontrolled or somebody who has been irradiated on low urinary tract or somebody who is in general immunocompromised. Now these are the patients who have a dominant fibroblastic response to any kind of trauma which occurs on urethra and prostate and it will result in healing by fibrosis. Now all these factors, catheter factors, low urinary tract factors, host factors, they not only play a role in preoperative period, but they also play a role in post TURP stage. And you can have a continuum of these insults. 
So now, if somebody asks you that what are the etiological factors responsible for post-URP bladder neck stenosis, and if you understood me well, where I said you have preoperative factors, also called pre-TURP factors, which will include if the patient has a prostate which is already diseased by a disease because of which there will be more fibrotic response like patients who have chronic prostatitis, there are some patients who have small prostate which is more fibrous and there are some patients who have prostatic abscess, multiple abscesses and when the healing occurs in these prostates, the healing response is more fibroblastic. Those who are smokers, those who have radiation exposures, they can have a more degree of possibility of developing bladder neck stenosis. Then there are intraoperative factors and there are postoperative factors. Again, postoperative factors are long duration traction applied to bladder neck or a patient who persists with urine injection after the operation. And in intraoperative factors, I mentioned to you, if you do a deep resection at the level of bladder neck and a lot of deep muscle fibers are exposed and you have to do a lot of cautery to uh, control the bleeders all around. And in some unfortunate patients, if you create subtrigonal kind of injury, so friends, look at this flow diagram and you will notice that in a patient, often there are multiple factors responsible for this kind of unfortunate happening. I hope you understood the answer to the first question. What has gone wrong and why has this gone wrong after four to six weeks of an apparently successful transuthal section? Thank you very much. In case you have any questions on this topic, you can write on my email. I'll be happy to answer them. For more videos on a similar topic, you can log on to my website, Dalila Academy of Urology. Thank you very much.